Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. This is Ethan Halfide, host of the Customer Discover Cast. This episode is brought to you by CustomerDiscovery.co. I'm here with Blaine, who is the CEO and founder of FitLift, a very exciting company. I found out about him through, I, I believe, another podcast or a post from a mutual connection on LinkedIn. And this was something that, you know, was on my mind for a while. I used to talk to with other fitness influencers thinking there is going to be AI or some sort of, you know, uh, real time feedback software that would pre present kind of, you know, a personal trainer at home that people could take in their pocket. And here it is right now. We have the man, the myth, the legend himself. Blaine, welcome. Hey, thank you, Ethan. Yeah, we're just happy to be here. Uh, we're really excited to share with the world what we've been doing and uh, what FitLift is all about. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you know, for people that don't know who you are, uh, and tell them a little bit about yourself. What led to you being here today right now? What was the inspiration behind the idea, as well as kind of your, your previous ventures as well? Sure. Yeah. Um, so what led us to be here today is um, I'm a person that likes to put data behind things I do and things I get passionate about. An example is uh, when I played golf, I would film my swing and draw lines on it to understand how to get better because form's so applicable to progressing in that sport. I then got in weight, into weight training in college and after college. And I wanted that same type of data with, you know, form exertion, being able to understand how the movements I did into the gym translated into uh, success. So I started looking for a product that could track my form, my movements, um, and my exertion levels, and really the, the presented that data together so that I could make the same level of, you know, judgment calls. And I found there was none. Uh, so then I decided to, to build it. Uh, I talked to a few of my friends that are heavily into fitness world. Uh, a few of them are physical trainers. And, you know, they said, yeah, this idea would be great. We think it's useful uh, based on what we need. So we started building this product and it's a great segue into what we do. Uh, FitLift is the world's most advanced personal trainer on your wrist. Absolutely. You can think of it like uh, Fitbit plus mirror. Uh, we, you simply put our device on your wrist, pair it with our app, and you're able to in real time track your movements in 3D so you can know how consistent your form is and ways to correct it for the next rep or the next set to prevent injury and get past those, uh, those um, you know, roadblocks in the gym, get to the next set of weights. You can also track your exertion levels and heart rate and cross-reference that to your form and pace to let you know if you should go up in rep count, pace, or weight for the next set to reach your fitness goals. Absolutely. Yeah, man. And I, you know, I've seen the demo, uh, you know, we spoke offline before this episode, guys, and I was amazed at seeing how the real time data was calculated as he did certain subsets of movements. I believe there's three um, planes, uh, you know, three axes, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry if I'm not using the right terminology that the, that's right. Yeah, that the sensor records. Uh, it's horizontal, uh, vertical, and then was the other one just basically like on a sagittal axis, like basically exactly. away from the midline of the body? Sagittal, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I was amazed because when it comes to, I have two of my favorite classes that I learned in my undergraduate, biomechanics and sports psychology. And you guys tap into biomechanics perfectly. It's almost as if you took the curriculum that was like, here is industry best standards for what to do. And you made a product that helped people do that independently who had never taken that course, right? Everyday mm -hmm. people who want to get into shape, you know, one of the biggest things starting out is correct form because you're teaching that muscle memory, just like with golf, you could do a lot of damage if you learn the wrong uh, form and you try to repeat that. So you guys are almost like that swing coach, if you will, teaching people proper mechanics independently uh, from the bat. I love it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. So, I mean, Walk people through kind of the origin story of, so you have such a, a beautiful skill set in the sense where you can take those big ideas and you have the know-how to be that technical founder. 
Um, talk, talk people through that early stage process of how you, you know, you started out with that. Um, so we, we just started, you know, you start with an idea, right? I'm, I'll go through, I've done a few previous startups, I guess I'll go through some, some things not to do. Uh, and then we'll, we'll talk about what we did. Absolutely. Um, and so I've, uh, I've founded two companies previously before this one one in college and one uh, shortly after college and these the i got to know a lot of founders right we you meet you kind of mingle in that club um and i've seen some some really good successes i've seen some big failures from other founders and i think the biggest thing that i can point to um that that really made people succeed is they solved a real problem. Um, really identifying what you're building, be honest with yourself about what you're building and what it does, and be honest about what problem it solves. And it's going to be a lot smaller than you think, right? Uh, nobody can build Facebook in, in a year, right? That type of company. But a lot of entrepreneurs, we all like to dream big, but they all try to build products that are that. And what you end up with is nothing that's good, uh, nothing that impresses people because you try to do too much. Um, but what also you don't do is, is products sell because they solve problems. So really understand what that problem is from the get go, talk to people. That's the main thing. Don't be afraid to talk to people even when you have nothing. Just say, if this existed, would you buy it? Um, and then as you're building it, continue to show it to people, continue to validate that, yes, this is something because because we you will have little small micro corrections as you're going that says, OK, oh, I'm building this is solving a problem. But what if I just presented the UI and slightly differently, it would solve the problem better for my customer. Um, and then that'll keep you on a better path. Your time's going to be used better. Um, I like to explain startups as a. Uh, ticking time bomb when you get money you only have so much time so you have to perform in that time unless you're uh, you, you got to move on so you have to use your time as most efficiently and that's one way to do it is to solve a real problem make micro connect corrections and it will lead to success with customers as you're going that will allow you to either start making profit or to secure your next round of funding that then extends your timeline so I would say, you know, the, the number one mistake founders make, okay, and I'm going to ask you this again, because, you know, this is super important. What would you say is the number one mistake that founders make? And how can they solve this? Yes, yeah, so I, I touched on it with um, solving the problem, right? They, they don't do that. Uh, another, I can go over another big mistake that's probably as equally as important. Um, is um, they don't really, they don't put the team together to, to pull it off. Um, you know, two to three people, everybody's got to have a really large impact on whatever you're building. And I go see a lot of founders, they go get, they're an engineer, they go get three, two other engineers to work with them. Uh, that won't work as well. You need people of equal skill sets all coming to the table that are very passionate about uh, that field. A pretty common thing you see in Silicon Valley and what a lot of people recommend even over on the, the East Coast in New York, the tech scene over there is to build, to have a hacker, hustler and a hipster on your team. So you yep. need a, an engineer, you need a guy to go sell it and hustle it. And then you need a designer and somebody just to make it beautiful and polished. Mm -hmm. And that's a pretty good trio. Um, it's all project specific, but you should try to at least have some diversity in your team. That's another, I would say another mistake to avoid as you're starting up. Absolutely. Yeah. So you had to start somewhere and we spoke about kind of, you know, how to 
form the organization early. You need diversity. You need a cross-functional organization of, you know, designers and, and salespeople and engineers. Mm -hmm. But talk about, you know, once you did get that team together, what was the next step after that? Like, how did you find, you know, how did you gain traction early on? Um, yeah, the, the biggest roadblock um, early on for us was, um, you know, con convincing investors that we were, we were worthy of their time. Um, and so you, you spoke about it very well as traction was so hard to get, so hard to get traction that also meant anything. It wasn't our friends buying this. Um, and so we were fortunate enough to sign our deal with Team Sunweb, a top three cycling club in the world. And in Q1 2021, we were going to have 46 elite cyclists using our device for weight training. Huge. Congratulations, man. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that, you know, to overcome that roadblock, we had to get gritty, right? We had to say, we're not going to fail. We're going to do whatever it takes. So uh, our partner Accents for the, the people that make our device, their company called Accents, uh, and they are very well connected in the fitness industry. And they're the one of the most accurate human motion tracking devices platforms out there. Uh, and we, um, you know, we made our teaser video with their device and we just spoke to them and they said, hey, we're making this teaser video. We're going to promote you as much as we can. Can you please reshare us? Because that's going to do a lot more for us than you would imagine. So they reshared our video on all the channels. And then that got around the Team Sunweb. They saw what we're building. And, and then they said, hey, wow. we have to reach out and contact these guys. And we just got lucky. And we're really gracious that it worked out. Um, but that's, the, that's not the normal road, I would say. What I've seen previously is um you really have to get gritty you have to be you have to be that guy walking into stores with your device saying i'm gonna do this um i'll give you actually another example to something we did is when we were performing market research i walked into gold's gym talked to their manager i rocked into 24-hour fitness talked to their manager i walked into pro sports club and talked to their manager and said can you please send this survey out to your members and um i got four no's and one maybe and i emailed all five of them <laughs> and then it turned out to be i got i uh, four out of five sent it to their mailing group wow uh, it's not being afraid it's saying what's the worst that can happen if i send an email that's I what i know. would say yeah so hold on, let's let's talk about that a little bit. You mentioned kind of the three pivotal roles: the hustler, the the hipster, and what was the last one? The uh, hacker. The yeah. hacker. Yeah. So you were the hacker and the hustler. That's the point I'm getting at. You also you coded the app, but you also went out there and you you sold your thing. You sold your product, man. Good stuff. Ah, uh, thank you, thank you. Yeah. It's, it, yeah. Yeah, the user research aspect is, I mean, obviously I'm a little biased because customer discovery is my core focus, but mm -hmm. building in public is arguably the most vital thing someone could do. In my opinion, you know, this is my assumption that that a founder can do to ensure that they never build something that's out of line with the marketplace. You ensure that every increment of your software, of your product is valuable to the end consumer by constantly getting feedback from them. You're going to build something that people love and ultimately want to pay for. And, you know, you, you guys have done a great job of that. And that's what's led, you know, talk about your timeline, by the way, mm -hmm. you know, from conception to where you're at right now, because we talked about it. You just got funding. Congratulations. Less yeah, than 2% of all entrepreneurs receive funding and they've successfully done so. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you very much. Our, our timeline, um, you know, they, they say a startup's a, a roller coaster, and I'm not going to um, lie and say that this has not been a roller coaster. Um, it, it definitely has. Um, so, about November last year, I had this idea. I began thinking about it. I was in the process of transitioning jobs at that point. Um, so, I just continued thinking about it. And then I got to a point where I said, This is too good to pass up. 
Um, I talked that that was when I had talked to people. So I had this idea. I was working on it at nights. I was talking to people that were very valuable for feedback. And in about April 1st, funny enough, was my first full day. Um, so I always remember that day. I quit my job and then April 1st was my first full time full day as a full time employee at um, FitLift. Um, then we started working on it. Um, we started, we assumed that the Apple Watch device was accurate enough to track what we wanted to track. And so we spent about three months um, trying to make technology to pull the mo motion data off the watch and accurately track a person's movement. Uh, we learned a lot in that time. We learned a lot about what you need what the hardware you need to be able to make this product work. And we just saw the Apple watch wasn't going to be that platform for us. So then we had to, I, another big roadblock we had was a technological roadblock and we had to overcome back, come that by um, switching the hardware platform. And we were, that was the first, um, what I like to call porch moment. So Every entrepreneur, every startup, they always have a porch moment. And what that means is when they're si it's when you sit on the porch at your house and you're thinking the company is going to fail, it's going down, um, it's time to move on, right? And that was our first one. And we said, you know what, I didn't quit. we didn't quit our job to um, basically give up this easy, right? Um, so then we, we saw another platform. We started researching. We researched more accurate motion tracking platforms. We found Exims. Uh, we reached out to them. We were lucky enough that they uh, took a chance on us and partnered with us. And then from that point, uh, we had to develop more and more technology on top, but we were starting from a much better platform. Um, and then from there, we kept making a better product, doing more market research, doing uh, making more media just to make sure we're building the right thing. And then uh, we just recently in September took on two new hires. They were contractors for us as of two weeks ago, they converted to full-time employees. So we're gracious to have them as well. And they've really awesome. helped with our success in R and D. Now we are, um, we are on our timeline to successfully launch this thing to the world and um, get, you know, get the, be able to fulfill the ask from our uh, Team Sunweb partners and hopefully be able to help them train better and, and win this upcoming season. Absolutely. End to end, how long has it been since you quit your job? I think you said April 1st, right? Was mm -hmm. your first full day as a uh, FitLift employee? kind of that's right employee. that's right yeah so <laughs> april 1st wow so like right before corona really really hit or covid really really hit america right yeah yeah, yeah. The, i think it was still like you know everyone was talking i think when italy shut down that's when we were like oh okay covid is really coming here what were your thoughts around that time were you like holy shit i picked a hell of a time to quit my job and start a business or were you like okay perfect timing uh yeah, um, I was a little, yeah, I was, that was the first one, a little scared, um, thought I'd made a lot of wrong decisions, but I looked at it that, uh, I looked at it like this is that coronavirus, um, it's, it, it's been forcing a lot of people into change, right? People have been changing lifestyles. And so, making a major change in, in your life, like starting a business, it just seemed like it made sense at that time. It just felt right because we would be spending a lot more time at home. You know, you have to work just, um, entrepreneurship requires a lot of those, those hours, a lot of midnight oil. And if I'm going to be spending my time at home so much, I would rather be working on something that I'm passionate about, something I think has potential um and then when it when hopefully when coronavirus we recovered that the things i built are ready to be shown to the world and um i i don't think there was a better time to do it because exactly every all you know work was being disrupted right people you talk about innovation well we've seen a lot of innovation with remote work 
and even policies changing at companies and they changed on a snap of a finger because they had to companies were forced to be innovative and i wanted to be part of that wave of innovation um absolutely so yes it was scary but it was something that was always on my mind and it was it felt right that that was the time to take that leap absolutely yeah and you know imagine so many people now you know they can't go to their gym you know they they can't have their personal trainer even over to train them because some people do at home workouts with their trainers uh, but now people are really kind of like in it for themselves you know they have to kind of guide their own workout and your your device is almost perfectly timed i mean is 100 percent actually perfectly timed so that people can monitor their form they can make sure they're working out safely and go about their day in a healthy way yeah we got we kind of got lucky but yeah um <laughs> with that but yeah we we feel like we've uh we've got to the market at the right time and we feel if we continue to reach our goals that uh we will hopefully see some success next year absolutely and you know i normally ask you know what is what is the best way for you to get your first 10 users and you know really helping out early stage founders you've answered that actually you know mm -hmm. you've answered that many different ways of how you built it public got user research you know you you made the most out of the partnerships that you did and you know that got you that connection with someone but uh answer that one more time for us like honestly in your own words what is your best most let's say you know, like a, a short, the shortest, most concise answer to getting your first 10 users. Don't be afraid to get scrappy. Directly yes. message people you think will be your customers. Directly walk into shops you think you're going to sell to. Directly pick up the phone and call the CEOs of businesses you want to partner with. Because you would be surprised at where that can lead. Absolutely not being afraid to put your thing out there you got to put that product out there even if it's not you know bright and shiny quite yet put it out there yeah exactly. a lot of people are scared to ship uh what is it uh, i think steve jobs says that great ceo ship they're not afraid to get their product out there uh-huh exactly That's awesome yeah so now you know we're we're all curious you received funding you received that initial traction blaine what is in the the most immediate future for your plans of 2021 2021 um hopefully it'll be a big year for us um we're going to we you know q1 2021 we're going to launch our device to sunweb they're going to be using it giving us feedback in the middle around june or july area we're going to do our public release to uh, the consumer so june july you said june or july yeah okay yeah good That's so important. our consumer will hopefully the consumer is going to get this device june or july it'll be available you can buy it from our website how many then, do you think you have in production um so we plan about uh, ten thousand units oh okay good um, stuff good stuff so hopefully we hit that um you know if just check us out on our website around them our product will be there. You can buy it. It's $100 a device. And it comes with a, a wristband that looks like similar to the Apple Watch. So you put our device in this wristband. The uh, wristband's high quality rubber molded material. It's very comfortable. Put it on your wrist, put the device in there, turn it on, and you pair it with our app. And our app costs $15 a month. So less than one session with the trainer. Much and less. The power of a trainer. <laughs> yeah um and um you're ready to go you're ready to use our platform um and so yeah just check us out around june or july and hopefully i have i have an inquiry i have a question as someone yeah. who's passionate about product and passionate about fitness do you have plans because there's you know it's it's highly not highly controversial it's on everyone's mind when it comes to peloton right how they Basically, people have, you know, kind of insulted them saying, you know, it's not a good business model to have an iPad on a clothing rack and think that it's worth so much money. They're, you know, they're stationary bicycles and now they're treadmills. I, I disagree yeah. with that. I think the community aspect and the progress tracking is huge. Do you have plans to offer 
uh, you know, fit lift group classes, maybe with an instructor that's a virtual, uh, you know, a virtual class, like a HIT training class. Absolutely. Yeah, that's not, we don't think we'll be able to get to that tech in 2021 and our roadmap for 2022 and beyond. Our vision is to allow the trainer to stay at home on their couch and the person they're training to be wherever in the world. And this form and exertion data can feed into the trainer and then the trainer can interact with the client and it makes the trainer's time scale better. And we, you know, we think that's important too. They don't have to drive to gyms and they can do more clients. Yeah. Um, and so as far as a group aspect to that, absolutely. I can see it evolve into a, definitely a group aspect. Um, and also outside of the group concept, there's a social concept. So, you know, I do an exercise uh, I record my form and then I challenge a friend. And so then if he follows it, he can receive a score and we can compete against each other as this leaderboard concepts are going to bring in, you know, we want to make going to the gym fun and we want to make it tech driven. And competitive. And we think that those <laughs> and competitive. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> you always want that perfect deadlift and squat. And we want people to be able to, uh, you know, keep one and up in each other because that exactly. it adds a little fun to the gym. That's, That's how Fitbit's so successful, right? You get to challenge people to those 10,000, you know, 10,000 steps a, a day. And I see a lot of people doing these 30 day challenges and they're so successful in promoting Fitbit because no one likes to be left out of those, you know, and same mm -hmm. thing with FitLift, man, you guys are going to do kind of the same kind of challenges when it comes to like actual like hit workouts and, you know, body weight workouts as well. Mm hmm. I exactly. wonder if there's opportunity. You you guys have probably you know all thought about all this, but even something like yoga, like there's such an opportunity there for making sure that you're doing yoga poses correctly. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you can use like training data to then like baseline the model, and then you know as people go through it as test data, you can kind of determine like eighty percent accuracy, ninety percent accuracy. Like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that would be really cool because a, a lot of people they like to start their day with yoga and that mm -hmm. makes you a vital part of their day when they make sure that they're doing the movements correctly. Uh, I don't know if you, we plan this, but a great segue into two other products that we have trademarked, protected and are on our roadmap. Oh, what actually, <laughs> I didn't know that you had that on your roadmap. I'm not well, <laughs> let's talk about it. Uh, fit sure. <laughs> so, we have one called fit swing. Um, and oh, that's yeah. we did talk for, about that uh, one. Yeah. That's for tennis, baseball and golf same concepts in there device on your wrist phone in your pocket and we can tell you if you're accelerating in the impact your angles at impact um and you know if you're over rotating or under rotating crucial for those sports and we also have another one called fit yoga that's going to tell you if your pose is correct and also if your exertion is correct um because if you're exerting yourself too much you're not um performing yoga correctly it's meant to relax the body mm. so absolutely um it's great wow. that that was something we discussed because that's absolutely on our radar yeah i i definitely looking back i remember speaking about fit swing because we spoke about the tight uh tideless performance institute and they mm -hmm. have arguably some of the most advanced technology there uh, with a core focus in biomechanics uh but we didn't talk about fit yoga i don't believe uh, from my mm -hmm. recollection but Honestly, fit swing is so exciting because millennials that are trying to get into golf, it, you know, one, it's, it's expensive Two, to hire an instructor is definitely out of budget for it. Like, you know, I don't want to just throw out a statistic, but for a lot of millennials, right. Mm -hmm. When you do something like that, you really make it a lot easier for people to know whether they're swinging correctly or not. And that's damn near impossible, man. Golf is a tough sport. It's a very difficult very sport. So when you have a, you know, a, a real time aid like that, that makes it a lot more fun and a lot less frustrating <laughs> when you go out and golf because it is a hell of a frustrating sport i think we can all agree there oh yeah yeah so it's i'm excited for that. spoiled as they say yeah i would love to be a, a beta user for that man that would be incredible absolutely yeah man but blaine today it, it's been fantastic man and i want you to basically tell the audience how can they find you uh what's the best way to keep in touch with you um Contact me at my email, uh, blaine at fitlift.com. So that's B L A I N E at F I T L I F T.com. Just shoot me an email. 
anybody that's anybody that's interested in our product i'd love to hear from you get your feedback and we still have a small amount of room on our beta list if you want to join that we can definitely add you awesome pick me pick me <laughs> <laughs> you're thank getting you one so. yeah thank you <laughs> we did talk about that thank you so much blaine it's been a, a a pleasure i look forward to staying in touch with you man congratulations hey thank you ethan thank you so much